I want to start, uh, start today by thanking our committee. Um, we would not be here today, we would not have the information that we have today if we had not passed the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act. Uh, this would not be taking place. I think the American people now understand uh, what this debate was all about. When Congress put in place sanctions to bring Iran successfully to the table, as we did, we granted the executive branch something called a national security waiver. And what that meant was the executive branch had the ability to waive our congressionally mandated sanctions to suspend them until such a time as we permanently waive them down the road. And as you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, over the objections of Senator Cardin and myself, unfortunately, uh, the executive branch uh, went directly to the United Nations uh, this Monday morning, uh, something that certainly was not in the spirit of this, but this is what was always intended. And uh, I do want to say that uh, while Secretary Kerry has often said, well, Congress will have the ability to weigh in at some point in time prior to this law being passed and causing this hearing to happen today, we now read the agreement and realize that what he meant was eight years from now uh, we would have the opportunity to weigh in because that's what it's that's what's stated in the agreement. So I want to thank everybody, uh, all 19 members, for coming together unanimously, making that happen, and giving us a role. It's a heavy lift, as we know, but a role that w did not exist uh, prior to that passing. I have to say we had a briefing last night, and I left there. I talked to members on both sides of the aisle. Um, I was fairly depressed uh, after last night's presentation. With every detail of the deal that was laid out, um, our witnesses success, successfully batted them away with the hyperbole that it's either this deal or war. And therefore, we were never, never able to appropriately question or get into any of the details because every time we did, it was either this deal or war. So I believe that to be hyperbole. Um, I know the Secretary last night pulled out a letter that was written in 2008 uh, by the prior administration. I don't know if he'll refer to that today, but as I thought about it laying last night in bed, I realized that what he was really pointing out with that letter is, unless we give Iran what they want, X. I mean, that's what really uh, that letter was used for last night. So let me just walk through that. We've been through an incredible journey. We began uh, 20 months or so ago with a country that was a rogue nation that had a boot on its neck. And our goal was to dismantle their program. We've ended up in a situation where the deal that's on the table basically codifies uh, the industrialization of their nuclear program. It's an amazing, amazing transition that has occurred. <laughs> And yet everyone here, not a person in this room, including our witnesses, everyone here knows there's not one practical need for the program that they're building. Not one. Not one. We've not had a single scientist, not a single witness can lay out any reasoning, not a single reason for Iran to be developing this program from the standpoint of what it means to them from a civil standpoint. Not one. Nine months after this agreement goes into effect, we realize that after Monday's uh, UN adoption, unless Congress intervenes, in 90 days this will be implemented. And then six months after that, in a total nine months from now, all of the sanctions that exist against Iran will be lifted. Incredible. Now there'll be a few remaining sanctions, but the big ones that matter will be lifted. So they'll have access to billions and billions of dollars. Um, their economy will be growing. They'll be shipping oil around the world. Um, it's an amazing thing. And so what happens, I think all of us figured this out as we went through the deal. Right now, we have some leverage. But nine months from now, the leverage shifts to them because we have a sanction snapback 
What they have, if we ever try to apply that, is what's called a nuclear snapback. <coughs> the way the deal is structured, they can immediately just begin. They can say, well, if you add sanctions, we're out of the deal. They can immediately snap back. So the leverage sifts to them. The PMD piece, the possible military dimensions, I think most of us call it the previous military dimensions because we know they were involved in that. Basically, that has no bearing, no bearing, per the agreement. Now, I know our witness will say, well, if they don't deal with this properly, we won't implement. But according to the agreement, it has no bearing whatsoever on whether the sanctions are removed or not. And yet, that was such an important piece uh, for everyone to know. Anytime, anywhere inspections. Last night, we had witnesses saying, I never said that. It's been a part of our mantra from day one. It's been a part of their mantra from day one, anywhere, anytime. Uh, inspections. Now we have a process that they're declaring is 24 days, but we all know that's not right. The 24 days begins after, by the way, the IAEA has found violations that they're concerned about, and then you give Iran time to respond to that, and then by the time it kicks in, there is a 24-day process, but it could be months. And as we know, in laboratories, when you're developing a, a nuclear warhead that is about this big, it's very easy to cover things up like that. And there, all, the, all the focus has been on finding uranium. There's other aspects of this that are very difficult to find. I know they've said this is the most comprehensive inspection regime that we've ever had. That's not true. That is not true. I've talked to secretaries of state and others. We had a far more comprehensive and rapid inspection program in Iraq, far more. And that certainly didn't serve us particularly well. Ben and I have written a letter asking for a different, additional materials that we don't now have. Um, one, of the, one of the items we don't have is regarding the agreement between Iran and the IAEA. And my sense is we're never going to get that letter. So the inspection entity that we're relying upon to find out whether Iran is cheating. We, we're not even going to have access to that agreement. But let me just say this. We do know one of the characteristics is very interesting. We have a prof professional athlete in Chattanooga that spends about a month uh, there. He's incredibly the role model. He has got in incredible integrity. He's a role model to the world. And uh, I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago about the program that professional athletes go through for drug testing. It's incredible. You, that is anytime, anywhere. There are qualities to this that, unfortunately, uh, I'm told I cannot get into. But there are qualities to this program that would not be unlike causing athletes to just mail in their own urine specimens in the mail and, and uh, and us believing that that's where it, uh, that it came from them. So look, I, I've got some questions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about who we're dealing with here. Most of us have been to Iraq many times. And I'll never forget uh, visiting General Odierno in Baghdad. And every time we'd visit General Odierno in Baghdad, he'd have on his coffee table the IF the IFPs that were used to, to maim and kill Americans. Um, they were laying out. They were made, the IEDs. They were laying there on the coffee table, every single one of them made by Iran. Once we developed the technology, by the way, to counter that, what they did next was develop something called an EFP, Explosively Formed penetrator. Now this is, what they do is they, they, they have a, an explosion. It heats up copper to go through a piece of machinery to maim and dismember Americans. This was all Iran, every single bit of it. We've all been out to Walter Reed and we've visited these incredible heroes that have lost, in some cases, two arms and a leg. Some cases, two legs and two arms.
We see them all over the country. They're living with this today. This is the country that we're dealing with, a country that created some of the most disturbing types and methods of maiming Americans that have ever been seen. They tried to kill an ambassador here in Washington, D.C. not long ago. I mean, that's, we know that. Ben and I went over to, with others, to the, uh, the other day to see something the Holocaust Museum had put together. A young man named Caesar had taken photographs of the Syrian prisons. Syrian prisons, which, by the way, Iran supports. Syria would not even, Bashar Assad would not even be in office today if it weren't for Iran. We went over and envisioned what the torture that's happening has been photographed and chronicled. Many of you have seen it on the internet. It's an amazing thing. It's happening right now, by the way, as we sit here. Some people might say, well, that was Iraq, and I don't know, should we have been there or not? This is happening this very second with the support of Iran. Do you understand that? People's genitals right now are being amputated. People are being electrocuted. This is happening this very second in a prison in Iran, I mean in Syria, that Iran is supporting. Some would say we haven't done as much as we could to stop it because, because of these negotiations. When I was in college, I wasn't a particularly good student. First part of college, I was interested in sports. The latter part, I was interested in working. I learned one thing. I learned about the critical path method, and I ended up building buildings all over our country. And I learned that you start with something like this, and you lay out a vision, and you build it out. And you begin with the end in mind, and you put first things first. It's sort of the critical path. And what I've seen our secretary do is, uh, I know he's developed a tremendous warmth with Iran's foreign minister, Zarif, and he talks about it often. But what I think you've actually done in these negotiations is codify a perfectly aligned pathway for Iran to get a nuclear weapon just by abiding by this agreement. I, I, I look at the things that they need to do, the way it's laid out, and I don't think you could more perfectly lay it out. From my perspective, Mr. Secretary, um, I'm sorry. Not unlike a hotel guest that leaves only with a hotel bathrobe on his back, I believe you've been fleeced. In the process of being fleeced, what you've really done here is you have turned Iran from being a pariah to now Congress, Congress being a pariah. A few weeks ago, you were saying that no deal is better than a bad deal. And I know that there's no way that you could have possibly been thinking about war a few weeks ago. No way. And yet what you say to us now, and said it over and over yesterday, and I've seen you say it over and over in television, that if somehow Congress were to turn this down, if Congress were to turn this down, the only option is war. Whereas a few weeks ago, for you, for you to turn it down, the only option is war. I don't think you can have it both ways. Let me just say this. If Congress were to say these sanctions cannot be lifted, it wouldn't be any different than the snapback that we now have, where, in essence, the United States on its own, the United States on its own, can implement snapback, but my guess is the other countries, as you've stated before, wouldn't come along. So we've got to decide which way that it is. I know you speak with a degree of disdain about our regional partners when you describe their reaction to this deal. But one of the things we have to remember is if we had actually dealt with dismantling their nuclear program, they wouldn't be responding in the way that they have. But not only has this not occurred, in addition, we are lifting the ballistic missile embargo in eight years. 
I have no idea how that even entered into the equation, but it did at the end. We are lifting conventional <coughs> weapons, Bargo, in five years. And in a very cute way, uh, with hortatory language in the agreement, unbelievably, we are immediately listing, lifting the ballistic missile testing programs. We're, we're, we're lifting that ban. So I'd have to say that based on my reading, and I believe that you have crossed a new threshold in U.S. foreign policy, where now it is the policy of the United States to enable a state sponsor of terror to, to obtain sophisticated industrial nuclear development program that has, as we know, only one real practical need. That is what you're here today to ask us to support. I look forward to your testimony and the appropriate questions afterwards.